Good morning, friends and members of the Monday Study Group. It's good to be with you again and to give you a sense of the discussion this morning in the in-person group as we study together uh, Acts chapter 13. Let's ask for God's guidance. God, thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to be with the early Christians to help them in their decision making, their discernment, to give them words to say, thoughts to think, actions to take. So guide us, we pray, 2,000 years later, that we may be responsive to your spirit in our lives. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Acts 13. Let's go see what's happening in this uh, amazing change and turn of events which is happening here. This is a watershed chapter. Uh, from now on, we leave Jerusalem for the most part. We'll go back there in Acts 15, but the rest of the whole book is, is no longer Jerusalem-centered, no longer Peter-centered, though he continues to show up only again in chapter 15 and then not for the rest of the book. And we instead focus on Antioch as the new center of Luke's narrative and a new apostle, Paul, the convert on the road to Damascus, Saul. And he is the one who will be the main protagonist in the last half of the book. So we're in Antioch. That's the Antioch in Syria. And it tells us in the opening of this chapter that there were a set of teachers there. There apparently was no one single leader in the church at Antioch. At least Luke doesn't tell us about that. It's always, uh, we always need to be cautious in reading between the lines and assuming things. We have no idea really what the church structure was like the administration of the church at Antioch, or really of any of the churches. Uh, we know that James emerged as the apparently spokesperson, apparently the spokesperson for the church in Jerusalem. But beyond that, it's, uh, it's all unknown territory. Uh, later on in Paul's letters, we'll get some idea of church structure and of deacons and bishops, overseers, elders, and others who serve churches, but here, not so much. We're, it's not a really of much interest to Luke at this point. We don't hear about it. Even if it did exist, we don't hear about it. Instead, at the opening of this chapter, we hear that there were five people who were prophets and teachers. Uh, in the church at Antioch, and it lists them by name. Of course, we've met Barnabas already. Simon, who was called the Black, or Niger. He was probably African. Uh, and also Lu Lucius of Cyrene was an African. We don't know if he was black or not. Uh, Menachem, or Mana or Menaean, uh, was a member of the court of Herod Antipas. This is not Herod Philip, it is not Herod Agrippa, uh, or Herod the Great, of course, long dead, uh, over 50 years ago, but this is probably Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee, and one of the members of his court had become a Christian. And of course, Paul, or Saul, the five people who were listed here as prophets and teachers. Um, and it, we don't know if all five of them had both of those spiritual gifts or if this is just a group, some having some gifts and others other gifts. But the main thing that Luke wants to emphasize here is that they are un this church and the people are under the guidance of the Holy Spirit while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. That may mean that they had a problem or an issue to deal with that required uh, extensive prayer and also the spiritual discipline of fasting. Uh, perhaps it had to do with the accumulation of Gentiles who had come to be believers and received the Holy Spirit without becoming Jews first. That concerned the leaders in Jerusalem, certainly, uh, and it may be the issue of uh, 
the significant prayer and fasting in the church at Antioch. But again, that's reading between the lines, and we're not sure why they were uh, engaging in both fasting as well as worship and prayer. But while they were doing this, they became convinced that the Holy Spirit had said to them, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Now, as I told the group this morning, I am very skeptical when anybody says, The Holy Spirit told me. Uh, certainly it's possible, but we are warned both in 1 John and in 1 Thessalonians to test the spirits to see whether they are of God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. Just because somebody says the Holy Spirit told me, as people do today, I was reading an article in the New York Times recently about people who became convinced that the Holy Spirit has told them to take some political position or to vote for some political candidate. And I am completely skeptical about that. I doubt that that really was the case. Uh, I think that needs to be tested by the lives and actions and fruit of those lives in terms of the character of the people that they are uh, either supporting or the issues that they are supporting. So. I was a bit chastised by one of the members of our group this morning for saying that I'm skeptical about that, and she wanted to make sure that we all knew that God does speak to people, even today, and that the Holy Spirit can tell people uh, that God wants something to be done. I don't disagree with that. It can happen, but I am pretty skeptical about the claims that it happens. Now here, I'm less skeptical because it's a group that is coming to this conclusion. That is, it is being tested by the group. It's not just one person who says, the Holy Spirit told me. Almost all of the cults got started that way, by the way, that one person, man or woman, heard from God, they claimed, and God had told them to be a certain kind of person or to do something or, to, or gave them a revelation of some kind. I don't accept any of that. So your, your teacher is pretty skeptical about religious claims that most people make, and I try not to make them myself. But here, I'm less skeptical because it is a group. It's a whole church, and it's five teachers, and they all come to the same conclusion, apparently guided by the Holy Spirit, that God wanted Barnabas and Saul to be set apart for a special work that the church that God wanted them to do. And so the church did that. Uh, they uh, continued to pray and fast to confirm their decision. And when they had, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So this is a group, not an individual. And it's a group conclusion that they're being guided by God to, um, you could say ordain, but certainly the idea is here setting apart uh, for a particular work. And Paul tells us in his letters later on that he did feel God had set him apart for this work that uh, the Holy Spirit gave him to do. So, verse 4, being sent out, not just by the church at Antioch, but being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they sail west and they land, they leave the port of Seleucia, Seleucia in uh, in Syria, and they sail to the nearby port on the island of Cyprus uh, called uh, Paphos. No, Salamis, sorry. They'll get to Paphos. They, they sail to Salamis, which is on the east coast, the southeast coast of the huge island of Cyprus, about a hundred miles across. And they go to the natural place to proclaim the good news about the Messiah, that is the synagogue of the Jews in the city of Salamis. Jews had synagogues all over the ancient world, all over the Mediterranean world. They are part of the general diaspora of the Jews across the, uh, the Mediterranean Sea on both sides in North Africa as well as up in Turkey and, and further on. There are synagogues of the Jews, and they become a natural place to preach the good news. Uh, 
because people have the background in the what we call the Old Testament in order to hear the good news in a context that makes sense for them. So they go to the synagogue of the Jews and they had John Mark with them to assist them. Boy, I wish we knew more. You could. This is where you started wanting to read through the lines. What was John Mark's job? How did they eat? Where did they stay? Did they work? How long were they there? None of these things are told in the text. Uh, we have to just make assumptions or better yet, forget all that, stop reading between the lines and just take what Luke says at face value that they were there, they lived, they must have had food, they must have had shelter and John Mark may have been of help to them in providing those kind of things. So we don't know how long they stayed in Salamis. Uh, it doesn't seem they stayed long at all, but they made their way the hundred miles on foot, nearly a hundred miles across the island to Paphos on the southwest coast of the island of Cyprus. And there they met a certain magician, how they met him, in what kind of context, we don't know. They simply came across a certain spiritual worker somebody claiming to speak for God, another reason to be skeptical, at least for me. They went through the whole island, met this magician. Well, we ran into a magician before and he was kind of bad news. This was Simon Magus, uh, the, the guy who became a believer but wanted to buy the power to give the Holy Spirit to people. And Peter had some pretty harsh things to say to him. We don't know what the outcome of that was, but that he was a magician means that he was dabbling in the dark arts. Uh, and apparently that's what this guy's doing, even though he's Jewish. So he's combining um, esoteric uh, and uh, cult, occ occultic uh, kinds of practices, occultic kinds of practices with Judaism. He is a Jewish false prophet, a magician, by the name of Bar-Jesus or Elymas, like Saul or Paul, this guy has two names as well. And he is associated with the political leader of the island, the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. Luke likes him, he calls him an intelligent man. And, and this um, Elymas or Bar-Jesus is somehow an influencer on the court in among the people who are in the court of Sergius Paulus, the Roman ruler of Cyprus. And somehow, again, don't know how, the leader, Sergius Paulus, has heard about Paul and Barnabas and wants to hear the word of God. That is, he wants to hear, he's heard from Elymas, bar Jesus. He's heard prophecies and whatever from this other guy, but he wants to hear what Barnabas and Saul have to say. So he summons them and wants to hear the word of God. That is the message that they were proclaiming across the island that he's responsible for. Maybe he's skeptical as well about what these two guys are doing and what they're saying. And we don't know how many places along the way that Paul and Barnabas stopped at. We don't know how long they stayed in any one place, how many days or weeks they have been on the island of Cyprus. It takes a while to walk a hundred miles. Even if you just keep on walking and don't stop to talk to anybody, it's going to take a long time. So they've been at this a while and news has come to the ears of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, that Paul and Barnabas have something to say and they say that it's from God. Yeah, okay, I want to hear them. That's what Sergius Paulus says. But Elymas feels threatened by this. He's been speaking the word of God. He's been speaking for Yahweh and performing magical arts and other things to uh, impress people. And certainly if he's hung around Sergius Paulus long enough, he's probably tried to impress him as well. Uh, but he doesn't want Sergius Paulus to hear Barnabas and Saul. He opposed them. 
and tried to turn the proconsul away from the faith that they were proclaiming. It's interesting to me that Christianity is here called the faith. Let me say about that the faith means two things. That it was called the faith means that it has a content, that there, that there were specific things, teachings, you could call them doctrines, though it's a little early to think about doctrine, but they were beliefs with uh, associated with Jesus, about Jesus, what God had done. Maybe it's just a story, uh, the story of Jesus of Nazareth, because that's what Paul goes on to tell them uh, when he preaches later on. But the faith has a content. But primarily, and I would say I feel pretty strongly about this, primarily that faith is not so much a content as it is an action of trusting, an action of relying on, having faith in, believing in, putting your confidence in someone or something, and that someone is God and what God has done in and through Jesus. So when this text says, when Luke says that Elymas tried to turn the proconsul away from the faith, he is talking about a relationship with God and a content in that relationship with God that has something to do with Jesus, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So it has a doctrinal content, uh, uh, statements, propositions, if you will, of truth about history and about the meaning of that history but it's primarily pointing to, faith primarily points in toward trusting God, a relationship with God, rather than just doctrine. You can't separate the two, they're both there, but when it says the faith, it doesn't just mean a bunch of doctrinal statements. But Saul, known also as Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit. We're in verse 9. Now, this is the third time that the Holy Spirit has been mentioned in nine verses. Luke wants you to know that everything that's being done is being guided by the Holy Spirit. So Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, as one person said, it looks like the Holy Spirit is pretty angry, pretty angry at Elymas for claiming to speak for God when he doesn't. He is a false prophet. He's telling pro, the proconsul and other people things from God that God has never said. And so he's a false teacher, and that is making the Holy Spirit angry. And so the Holy Spirit, through Paul, says to Elymas, bar Jesus, says to him, You son of the devil, you enemy of all that is good, all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, you have secret motives. Will you not stop making crooked the straight path of the Lord? That's pretty strong stuff. Paul doesn't pull any punches here. He's filled with the Holy Spirit and he feels called to say these negative things about the character of Elymas. Maybe Elymas needed to hear that. Maybe later on Elymas repented. We don't know. Uh, but Paul speaks directly to him. I also like what he says at the end about making crooked the straight way of the Lord. That makes him the opposite of John the Baptist, doesn't it? John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness like one, uh, a prophet in the wilderness saying, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight a highway for our God. Every mountain be uh, brought down and every valley be elevated and all flesh will see the glory of the Lord together. That prophecy from Isaiah. Isaiah uh, prophesied and John the Baptist felt he was the fulfillment of that, making straight the way of the Lord, direct to the way of the Lord, not Elymas. He's making crooked the way to God, if, if you get there at all. He is, he's making it difficult for people to come into a right relationship with God. And Paul calls him out on that and says to him, now listen, buddy, verse 11, the hand of the Lord isn't with you. The hand of the Lord is against you. And you will be blind for a while, just like Paul had been blind for a while. 
you will be blind for a while, unable to see the sun, and immediately it happened. And a mist and a darkness came over him, and he went groping around looking for someone who could lead him by the hand. It didn't last for long. Paul said it would be temporary. We don't know how long it lasted. But it, this miracle of blindness showed, it showed the proconsul that Paul was speaking with some authority, with some spiritual authority. And it says in verse 12, and we talked about this a little bit in trying to understand it, it says in verse 12, right after this incident of the blindness of Elymas, the pro, when the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed. For he was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. You've got two things here. You've got people coming to believe because they see a surprising event. So it lended this miracle that Paul did of blinding Elymas was for Sergius Paulus evidence or a sign that what they were teaching about Jesus was true. Now, it implies that there was also teaching about the Lord, but it also says that the sign that accompanied the teaching was helpful in converting Sergius Paulus to believe in Jesus. Uh, belief is a, an initial stage. It may be caused by external events that are surprising and astonishing, but if it's to take root and last, like in Jesus' parable of the four soils, if it's to last through persecution and other issues and cares of the world and so forth, if it's to last, it needs roots. And that root is going to be in the teaching. And so people might become Christians at a Billy Graham meeting, let's say, in the past, uh, might become Christians because of the preaching of an evangelist or in an emotional moment. But if that faith, initial faith, is to take root and last, it needs a community of disciples who help that person, who teach that person, who support that person. Christian faith grows in community. There are really no Lone Ranger Christians. We all come out of a tradition that has been ahead of us, that has provided us with scriptures and hymns and prayers and a whole history of Christians interacting with God. We stand on the shoulders of all those who go before us and we need that community to strengthen us in our own faith through our own times of difficulty and doubt. All right, on to verse 13. So Paul and his companions left Paphos. How long did they stay? We don't know. Were there other Christians besides Sergius Paulus who became Christians as a result of Barnabas's and Paul's preaching? We don't know. Uh, all we know is that Sergius Paulus became a Christian, maybe others as well. Were there Christian communities set up across Cyprus as Paul and Barnabas went? We know that was a pattern elsewhere. Maybe they were there weeks and weeks and began small Christian communities in all the places that they preached the gospel. Luke doesn't tell us anything about that. It would be assuming something that was a pattern, so there's some evidence for it. But again, nothing in Acts chapter 13 about any Christian communities anywhere on Cyprus. They convert Sergius Paulus, and shortly after, and even shortly is an assumption on my part, they leave and set sail with Paul's companions. It's plural, but it doesn't include John Mark. John, however, left them and returned to Jerusalem. Now that's what it says in my NRSV. John left them and returned to Jerusalem. One of our members in their commentary on Acts, there was a list of five possible reasons why John Mark could have left them. Some of them understandable, positive reasons. Others 
ne more negative reasons like cowardice or not being able to take the hardship or simply being homesick. Uh, but John's mother Mary in Jerusalem may have been ill. He may have been felt called by God to go back to Jerusalem. Paul doesn't think so later on, but we don't know why John Mark left them. Uh, one of the translations says deserted them. Well, that's pejorative for sure. Uh, it just says that he left them and went back to Jerusalem. But Barnabas and Paul and others maybe, because it says companions, went on sailing from the west end of the island of Cyprus. Check this out on your map. Sailing north to modern day Turkey to the area of, Pan of Pisidia, in a, the region of Pisidia. Uh, well, sorry, first, uh, before that, they came to Perga in Pamphylia. Pamphylia is like a province or a state, and Perga is one of the main cities in that state. And so they came there first to the port of Perga in Pamphylia. John left them, at that point, maybe, he stayed at the port and then sailed back to Jerusalem. But they went on from there. How long did they stay in Perga? Did they preach in the synagogue at Perga? We don't know, even if there was one. We don't know. It doesn't say. It, you, it, you gives, it gives you the impression that they, they arrived there, John left them, and they immediately went on north across the land and came to Pisidian Antioch. This is a different Antioch than the one they left in Syria. There were towns named after uh, the Seleucid rulers, the Antiochenes, uh, and there was an Antiochus first and second and third and fourth even, uh, and, and they were rulers of parts of the geographical territory that had been in earlier times, 300 years earlier, 400 years earlier, been conquered by Alexander the Great. His successors ruled that territory and named towns after themselves. Antioch was one of those. So this is Pisidian Antioch. And as their pattern was, they went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down as one of the attenders, Jewish attenders of the synagogue. Barnabas and Saul are Jews. They, they're Christians, but they're Jews. And they go to church. They go to synagogue. That's where they belong. These are their people. So they go and they sit in the synagogue and the worship service goes on. There are hymns. There are songs to be sung. Uh, there are probably psalms. There are scripture readings to be read and prayers. And after the scripture readings, a message was sent to them by the rulers of the synagogue, the officials of the synagogue, that as visitors, whom maybe they heard were teachers, if you have some message for our people here, uh, you're welcome to say it, just to speak. Feel free to give it, they say. And so Paul, this time, not Barnabas, but Paul stood up and he gestures to maybe for people to sit down or to be quiet or whatever, but with a gesture, he begins the first full speech of Paul in Acts. So it's a significant one, and it gives us a pattern for what Luke believed was the pattern of Paul's preaching. Now, we do not think Luke was one of the companions here. We have no reason to think that. Uh, we're thinking that Luke is relying on a source that he had for this early preaching of Paul. Do we know that for sure? We do not. Luke may have been, but usually when Luke is present, he says we. We did this and we went there and we sailed and we went to this town and, and he uses the first person plural pronoun when he himself is present. We're going to see some of those we passages later on in Acts. But Paul and his companions go to the synagogue on the Sabbath in Pisidian Antioch and they are invited to, to speak to the audience. And so Paul begins by telling them things that are well known to them. He recites 
the history of Israel. He starts with the patriarchs and going down into Egypt and the for and the suffering in Egypt and then the 40 years wandering in the wilderness after the Exodus and the entrance into the land of Canaan. He's reciting the Old Testament story, isn't he? He recites that story. He recites it down through the time of the judges and the prophet Samuel and the request of the people of God to give them a king. And that Saul, King Saul, same name as Paul's Hebrew name, became that king and ruled Israel until David was chosen at king. And at that point, Paul stops the history. Now, there's a lot more history in the history of Israel, as you know, after David's time. But as, when he gets to David, that becomes a key jumping off point for using David and the story of David as a setup for the application to Jesus. Because of David's posterity, God brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus. That, he doesn't call him the Messiah. He calls him the Savior. And he mentions that John the Baptist, not only was it foretold in the Old Testament that there would be a Messiah Savior, but John the Baptist, whom these Jews in the synagogue in Antioch may have heard of, uh, John the Baptist also pointed to Jesus. And Paul wants to draw on that knowledge as well to say that not only does the Old Testament point to Jesus, but John the Baptist did too. And God is now, he's saying to the audience here in verse 26, you descendants of Abraham and you Gentiles here in the audience who fear God, I want you to know that this message of salvation has been now sent to us as well. We wondered about the term salvation here. In American Christianity, it tends to mean uh, going to heaven when you die. But that's a small part of its meaning in the New Testament and especially in the Old Testament. It's a more comprehensive term for right relationships with God and with other people. The world the way it was meant to be. It's shalom, it's peace. Peace with God, peace with your neighbor, justice, righteousness, right relationships. It's a really big term and it didn't come to mean eternal life and going to heaven when you die until much, much later, and that still is a small part of it. We know that at, in, uh, at the event of the ascension of Jesus that opens the book of Acts, the apostles say to Jesus, is this now the time when you are going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Their idea of salvation was political and social and earthly. They were not thinking about salvation as believing in Jesus as your Savior and going to heaven when they die. That came later, but it wasn't the core understanding of what salvation, shalom, sometimes it simply means victory in the Old Testament. In a political and military context, salvation means God's acts to save Israel politically from their enemies. It's a really big term. In American Christianity, we've made it a rather small term. And so Paul here wants to speak about salvation in the big sense that it's connected with Jesus, with the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, whom God raised from the dead and appointed to be his witnesses. And so we, as witnesses to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, <clears throat> we bring you good news at the end of verse 30. We bring you this good news that God has fulfilled his promises for us by raising Jesus from the dead. And I'm going to stop here because we're 34 minutes into the video. We did go a little bit further in the Monday study group in person this morning because we have an hour and 15 minutes and I only want to take 30 to 35 minutes of your time. So continue to study this passage. We'll pick it up next week with the speech that finishes the speech of Paul and to see what happened after that in Pisidian Antioch. Uh, 
and beyond as Paul and Barnabas continue to carry the gospel uh, sent out by the church at Antioch under the guidance and power of the Holy Spirit. God bless and guide you this week as well. In Jesus' name, amen.